We are Life Church Livonia. All right, good morning, Life Church Livonia. How is everyone today? I'm so glad that you chose to brave the weather. I'm not sure what's going on, but it's now raining, I hear. And so this is uh, unacceptable. My name is Brian. I am the pastor here at Life Church Livonia. And like I said, I'm so glad that you chose to brave the elements to get here uh, to church today. And I think it's gonna, you're going to find that it was worth it because uh, uh, this is the place where you can come and, and, and be known and to, to grow in, into a place where you can know God. And our hope is that as we worship, as we uh, engage in the, in the sermon today, that you would actually, that something about God or something about yourself would be revealed to you that would begin a process of transformation for your life. And so we are starting a brand new series today. It's called Dealing with Feelings. And uh, the reason that we've chosen this series in particular is that, uh, I really believe that a lot of us uh, kind of uh, vacillate back and forth uh, between either f- uh, being kind of controlled by our feelings or suppressing our feelings, either um, being overwhelmed by our feelings or trying to stuff them down. And I believe that there's a, another way, a third way, uh, where God begins to transform our feelings and helps reveal things about ourselves and reveal things about um, our lives that we can only know by growing more in touch with those feelings. And so what we're going to do uh, throughout this series is help uh, you engage God in a way that is transformative. That is my prayer for you. And so one of the things that, that we've, we've noticed is that is there, are, there are times uh, when we encounter certain topics where a song captures either a path forward out of a struggle or it captures that, that struggle perfectly. And as we were prepping for today's sermon, which is on dealing with anger, uh, we came across a song by a group Sleeping at Last that's entitled Anger. And, uh, and I really felt like, man, this song, um, it, it actually helps you feel what it feels like uh, when a person grows angry and describes the process that you go through as you, uh, as you uh, lash out at times or as you struggle with this. And so what we've done is we've asked the band to, to come and play this. I'm super excited. They did a great job first service. And so check out Sleeping at Last's Anger. So first of all, our band's pretty amazing, aren't they? So good. I love it. I I love that line. It says, till it all spills out, reckless but honest words fill my mouth. And I think if, if you've ever struggled with anger, th- this line, uh, and that you can feel it. You know what that's like when words just spill out of your mouth, and they're honest words, but they're reckless words. And, and then it's like kerosene on a flame of doubt, he says. And you wish you could take them back, and, and you wish you could pour holy water on it, he says. But now you've left miles and miles behind of jagged lines. This is anger. This is anger in, in a destructive form. And for some people, it's a cycle that gets repeated over and over and over again in your life. And one of the lyrics of the song says that sooner or later, the fires die down and I'll open my eyes again. And when we do, we're like, how did that happen again? How did I end up in that same place over and over again? And how can I ever escape it? Like, how can I, how can I break that cycle and so what we want to do today is, is we want to begin to deal with anger. And I love what, what Aristotle said about anger. He says, anyone can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person uh, to the right degree at the right time for the right purpose in the right way, this is not easy. He wrote these words thousands of years ago, and they are still true today. That anyone can get angry, but to do anger correctly, to do anger in a a way that is is redemptive and right and holy and beautiful is so difficult. Yet I believe it's possible. And so so the reason that we started uh, this whole series on dealing with feelings with anger is because uh, this has been my journey. Uh, and honestly, from, from even an early age, I remember uh, living in a place where I was either trying to control or suppress my anger, or I was dealing with the ramifications of it relationally. And so uh, then I met Jesus, and everything didn't change overnight. But over the last uh, t- two decades or three decades of my life, uh, what God has been doing in my life is, is a slow and beautiful redemptive process where he is literally redeeming my anger. 
and, and bringing me to a place uh, where I am healthier and holier now than I was when I began. But it is still a journey regularly in my life. Something that, uh, that I believe God is going to be working on in me and through me for as long as I draw breath. So this is your, your vulnerable pastor moment, the, the, that this is a sermon. It was actually kind of funny. I prayed all week that I wouldn't have situations this week that made me angry. Because what you have to know is that uh, we talk about this regularly. You have to eat the word before you can teach the word, which means typically when I, if I'm going to preach something, I have to actually own it first. I have to live it. So I was like, Lord, just let it be a really calm week. I would love for it just to be one of those weeks where everything goes really smoothly and nothing goes wrong and nothing tr- triggers that frustration or that anger. And it was perfect because I especially prayed that nothing would happen on Sunday morning. And then first service, I, I walked out on stage and literally as I start to walk out on stage, my mic starts like popping and crackling and exploding. And they had to, I had to stop the service and have them bring me another mic. And I'm like, the Lord did that to me on purpose right? Gave me an opportunity for frustration right before I preached this important message. And here's the thing, is that it works. What we're going to be talking about today, it works. It transforms your heart. It transforms your response. And so, uh, so I just want you to know that if you're a person uh, that, that deals with anger, that this is an important morning for you. This is an important topic for you. And what I'm going to be doing is pouring out uh, some of what, the, what God has taught me over the last 20 years or so. And for me, it all began uh, really with an acknowledgement that human anger, my anger that, that this comes naturally to me, is not always a good thing. And so we start with James chapter 1, verse 20. And this is what he says. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Human anger, the, 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 my natural tendency towards anger, it doesn't produce or create what God desires for me, what God desires for you. It doesn't make us into the kind of person that we were designed to be. In fact, it can prevent us from reaching that place. It can prevent us not only from becoming that kind of person, but it can pre- prevent us from stepping into those kinds of relationships. Because anger in its human form is, is powerful and it is dangerous. It's powerful and it is dangerous. Nothing disintegrates our body, disintegrates your body more than anger. Many studies have shown this to be true, that people who constantly carry anger or are constantly living out anger in their body, it actually damages the cells in your body. It's it's more dangerous to to your heart than, than almost any other activity you can engage in. Anger. Dangerous to your body, increased uh, levels of of disease and sickness in so many different areas of your life. And and some of it's because of anger. Nothing disintegrates your bodies more than anger does. Nothing disintegrates community more than anger. You want to ruin a really great party? Lose your cool in the middle of it. Have a super awkward, angry conversation with your spouse at the baby shower, right? Right? It breaks community. It breaks relationships. Uh, and, and, and it does it really quickly. You could, spend, you could spend a decade building a friendship or a relationship and you could potentially ruin it in 30 seconds of anger. It disintegrates things. Our bodies, the communities we live in, it disintegrates wisdom. It actually pulls wisdom apart. I know this is true because how many times have you been in a moment where you got angry and you said something or you did something and then later when you were no longer angry, you were thinking, what was I even thinking? Like that was, that was stupid. And it was. And the, the problem was you weren't thinking because anger took over you know, the cognitive pathways of your brain and, and it dictated your behavior, it dictated your words, your actions, everything you did in that moment because anger has the power to deteriorate, to disintegrate very, the very wisdom that you've attained. You could know what the right thing to do is. You could know what the right thing to say is and you get angry and you lose control and you don't do any of it. Anger is both powerful And it is a dangerous force. And as I describe it that way, it sounds really awful, right? If we just stopped at James 1.20, 
and we read that human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires, it could lead us to believe that what we need to do is we need to stuff it, we need to repress it, we need to avoid it at any cost. But we have to start asking some questions. Is it always wrong? Is anger always bad? Is it always a sin to be angry? And I believe the answer is no. And so and, and the way that we, that we land on that is we begin to wrestle with the rest of the texts in God's word. You look back one verse prior to James 1.20 and verse 19, where it talks about being slow to anger. And you're thinking, well, hold on, which one is it? Is it that I should avoid anger because it doesn't produce what God desires for my life? Or should I be slow to anger because those things don't seem to jive, Right? But if anger is something we're to avoid at all costs and never engage, then why does Paul say in Ephesians 4, 26, that in your anger, do not sin? Why does he say that? If we're supposed to avoid anger, then why would he make this statement that assumes, A, that you will get angry, and B, that there's a way to be angry without sinning? We have to to wrestle with this and come to grips with this. We have to wrestle with, with other parts of the Bible when, when God's anger is described. This will start to mess with your head a little bit. You're like, well, I don't really understand well, if, uh, how, how anger can ever be a good thing because maybe in your life, you've never experienced it as a good thing. We have to wrestle with verses like Ezekiel chapter seven, verses eight through nine, which says this, this is from God's perspective. He says, I'm about to pour out my wrath on you and spend my anger against you. I will judge you according to your conduct and repay you for all of your detestable practices. I will not look on you with pity. I will not spare you. I will repay you for your conduct and for the the detestable practices among you. And then you will know that it is I, the Lord who strikes you. Some of you you were like, yeah, that's my jam. I feel that way about someone right now. Then you will know that it is I, Brian, who strike you, right? So broken. So we look at this and we think, how is this? We don't understand. Like, how is it possible that God could be that and loving, merciful, graceful, embracing of all, no matter what you've done and where you've been? How can we, how can we correlate this God with Jesus, who is God, and says, let the little children come to me, who has compassion and mercy over broken people lying at his feet, who other people want to stone in their anger and their their righteous indignation. And Jesus lifts them up, says, who's here to condemn you? How do we how do we kind of uh, look at this in a way that, that helps make sense? And, and I think the reason we struggle with it, the reason that we can't understand a God that is both loving and a God that can get angry is that we don't fully understand holy anger. It doesn't make sense to us because for the most part, many of us have never experienced it, at least not in a way that we could put our finger on. We don't understand holy anger. We don't understand the difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger, meaning the anger that is right before the eyes of God, uh, that, that, that keeps us in beautiful, deep relationship with God, and unrighteous anger that drives a, drives a wedge between us and God and drives a wedge between us and people. We have to sort out the difference between the two if we're ever gonna make any progress in our own anger. It's critically important that we understand this and that we, that we begin to, to kind of unpack what does holy anger look like? What does God's anger look like? And one of the things that I think that is really critical for us to know is this, is that the anger of God is always used for the promotion of good and the eradication of wrong. The anger of God is always used for the promotion of what is best for you and I, what is holy for you and I, what is needful for you and I, or, and or, it's used to, to, uh, for the eradication of something that is broken and doesn't need to be there. This is how God uses it, redemptively and beautifully. This is the anger of God. This is the holy, right, beautiful, needful anger of God. And the thing about it is he gave it to us as a gift. He gives his anger to us as a gift when he, when he, when he brings it upon people, but he also, also gives it us the capacity to experience the same thing. But it goes wrong. It gets sideways in our life. And so not only can we look at this and say, okay, I understand, I'm beginning to understand what that means, but we also have to realize that anger is also a dangerous power that goes wrong because of sin, and can only be healed 
by the power of the one who gave it to us in the first place. So on the one hand, it's this beautiful opportunity to, to, to eradicate wrongs and to, and to elevate what is good and beautiful and holy. Uh, at the same time, in our lives, it, it, can, it can go wrong because of sin. But God can heal it. God can heal it. No matter who you are, no matter where you're at, no matter what you've done, God can begin the process of healing your unrighteous anger. So I want to describe to you, we can spend the rest of the morning describing unrighteous anger, but I just want to give you a a couple of brief snapshots about what it might look like. Unrighteous anger reacts and attacks with no regard for the way it's damaging the person or the people that it's directed to. Unrighteous anger reacts and it attacks without even sometimes realizing the the damage that it's creating. This is not the kind of anger that gives God glory. This is not the kind of uh, anger that God is calling us to. Not when it reacts. Uh, The knee-jerk reactions where you're already saying something or doing something before you even know what's happening. And next thing you know, you have a broken relationship or a broken situation at work. This is unrighteous anger. It's unrighteous anger if you're attempting to control the people around you or the, pe- the person in your life or the situation. If you're trying to control it because you believe that that, that person or that situation uh, stands in the way of something you believe is needful for your life. You're, you're looking at them at that situation. You're like, I, I have something I value, I have something I need, and you are in my way, and I will control you, or I will control that situation so that I get what I feel I'm deserved, or I I get what I feel like I desperately need. It's unrighteous anger if you're attempting to control people or situations uh, because you believe that, that you are doing it right, or you know what's right. You're like, well, you're doing that wrong, and it makes me really frustrated, so let me tell you, what, everything you're doing wrong. Let me control you. Let me control this situation. Let me unleash your anger so that you can get it right because you're wrong and I'm not. I figured it out. This is unrighteous anger. And it shows up all around us over and over and over again. But righteous anger is different. Whereas unrighteous anger doesn't worry about the damage it's inflicting, righteous anger begins with a basic innate desire to bless, to lift up, to restore, to fill people with life, not tear them apart. It gives rather than drains. Righteous anger is different. I love what Dan Allender says about this in his book, The Cry of the Soul. He says, righteous anger warns invites and wounds for the greater work of redemption. It is full of a strength that is neither defensive nor vindictive, and it is permeated by a sadness that is rich in desire and hope. Most importantly, righteous anger allows the offense to be seen as an issue between the offender and God. The very first time I read this, this phrase, I was reading through this book, The Cry of the Soul, and I came to this this phrase about what righteous anger is, that it warns, it invites, it wounds for the greater cause of redemption. And I read it over again, and then I read it a third time, and then I read it a fourth time, and then I read it out loud to someone, and and then I texted it to someone else as a quote the very first time. This is years ago. And I stopped reading the book. Not because I was, I was upset and I didn't want to read anymore, because I couldn't go on past this because it wrecked me so deeply. Because you see, up until that point, I had a, a real confusion in my head and in my heart about what righteous anger was. Because I believed up until that moment in my life that my anger was righteous if the cause of my anger was justifiable. If I believe that, that what you did or what you said or what they were doing or what that situation was, if I believe that I was justified to feel angry, then my anger was righteous and I was wrong. 100% wrong. The cause matters, friends. There are some things that you should be angry about. There are some, some things that create justifiable anger that start, the, uh, start you on a path toward righteous anger. But the cause alone does not make your anger righteous. It's what you do with the anger after it's triggered that begins the process of making it righteous. The cause is only a really small 
portion of it? How do I respond? What's my intent? How do I see people? What what do I hope will happen as a result of my anger or my words being unleashed upon a person or a situation? I hope that this messes with your head a little bit about your anger. Dan goes on and he says this, our reaction to the pain and injustice of life will only move toward godly anger if we own up to our struggle with God and move toward him with our questions. You want your anger to become righteous? You want it to become holy? You want it to become restorative? You want it to become helpful even? You can't just base your anger upon a cause. You have to actually root your anger in God's love and grace. You have to move toward God with your anger, toward him with your questions, toward him with your struggles, toward him with the causes of your anger in the first place, moving closer and closer and closer to God so that he can redeem your anger. We we have to to, to hear this and, and look at it and be willing to do it and ask the question, how do we deal with our anger? And this is the answer. We move towards God. And so what I want to do for the remainder of the sermon is paint a picture for you of how I have have been moving towards God for 20 years and the way that I believe would be helpful for you and all of us as we do this in our life. Because every single one of us either struggles with this or knows someone who does. Every single one of us. And as we deal with our anger, as we move towards God, the very first thing that we have to do is you have to be willing to admit that you're angry in the first place. You have to be willing to admit that you are angry. And for some of you, this is really easy. You're like, I don't even have to tell people that I'm angry. Like admit you're angry, no problem, check, I got it. I don't have to say anything because you can feel my anger in the room, right? It's like, oh yeah, Brian's having a rough day and turn around and walk out back out the door. It's like, oh, I can feel it, not a good time. But for others of you, that's not you at all. Because something's happened in your life that's taught you that that anger is dangerous, that it's never good, that it has to be repressed, that it has to be stuffed. It might be because you've experienced really unhealthy, broken anger from someone else in your life and you want nothing to do with it ever again. You told yourself when you were a kid, I will never be angry like that. Or maybe it's a situation uh, where uh, you, don't, uh, you don't have the confidence in yourself to even trust your own emotions. You're like, well, maybe I shouldn't be angry. Maybe it's really my fault. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm the issue here. And so you stuff it and you repress it and you push it down. For some of us, we have to start here. You have to give yourself permission to, to be angry. There are times when you should be. There are, there are causes, there are injustices in our world that should trigger a process of anger that, that leads to God. And we have to give ourselves permission to do that. We have, to, we have to be able to admit our anger before we can look at our anger. Some of us don't even know it's there. And because we don't know it's there or we're unwilling to admit that it's there, it becomes a poison in our soul. Always there, always affecting everything but never being healed because you're unwilling to look at it. We have to give ourselves permission. Especially in the church, I think we have to give ourselves permission. In some cultures within church cultures, we've we've believed that anger is always bad. But listen to what John Christensen said about anger. He was an early Christian author and he said, he that is angry without a cause sins. He that is not angry when there is a cause, sins. For unreasonable patience is the hotbed of many vices. I believe that in the, in, the, in the Christian church, we don't get angry enough about the right things. And we don't get angry enough about the right things in a way that becomes redemptive. We simply react and attack when we do get angry, and it doesn't become uh, this holy, beautiful process that draws people into restoration. And there are times when we've, when we've seen people within the, the, the global Christian community get really angry at things that they believe are unjust, and they're right, but the way that they responded was not righteous, and so we threw the baby out with the bathwater. We said, well, that cause must not be true. And we respond to their, their sinful, broken anger 
I believe that that what's needed is not a repression of anger, but a purification of our anger. We need to be angry. There are things that that God despises that happen on this earth and that we must be against. We must stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. But we have to identify what are the things that actually deserve our anger and then we have to admit that we're feeling it. Because in order to correct it, in order to purify it, We have to look at it first. But when it comes, and you can feel it, you can sense it, you can see it, when it comes, the very next thing that we have to do is we have to push the pause button. You must push the pause button. And I think, personally, then when it comes to television, the pause button is one of the greatest inventions that ever occurred. Growing up, we had a really simple TV. It was one of those dial kinds. If you're under the age of 35, maybe you don't even know what I'm talking about, but you had to get up actually off the couch to change the channel. And if you weren't in front of the TV, when your show was happening, you didn't watch your show ever again. This is the way it worked. Some of you were like, no, like I can't pause. I can't DVR it. I can't just just, uh, binge watch the whole season and get caught up. No, if you missed that episode of Tom and Jerry, you missed it, right? Or Gilligan's Island. I'm so dating myself. What's wrong with me? I think the pause button is one of the greatest inventions when it comes to TV because it allows us to not miss out on something that we thought was important. Well, I think when it comes to our anger, the pause button is what allows us to not miss out on something that's not only important, but it's critical. The pause button is what allows us to uh, disengage from the moment, disengage from the struggle, and engage God. We have to push the pause button or else we will never find our way to a space where we experience righteous anger. It's why we're told over and over and over again in Scripture that we are to be slow to anger. The pause button is what enables us to be slow to anger. So we go to Psalm 37. And we read what it says about this. He says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. This is hard. For some people, the most difficult step was admitting that you're angry. But for for most of us, the most difficult step is to pause when you are. To, To be still before the Lord. To wait patiently for God. To not engage immediately. Why do we struggle with that? Because we want justice now. And we want it our way and our time and to our satisfaction. And God says, pause. Deep breath. Be still. Be still before me. Not just still before your anger. Be be still before me. Don't just be still before people. Be still before me. Wait. Do you trust me? That's what God says. Do you trust me? Wait patiently. Bring your anger to me. See what I do with it. See where I point you. See how I heal you. But we want justice now. There are issues uh, that, that we've seen people engage throughout our country. Uh, I, I, one of them that I'm passionate about is issues of racial, racial righteousness. And there are many people that are, have, they have just cause to be angry at the way they've been treated. But what's happened is that some people have reacted and attacked and said we're justified in doing that in a way that's actually damaged their cause. But I have a friend, his name is Dominic Gilliard. He's part of our denomination. And this is a man who is as passionate about racial righteousness and, and racial reconciliation as anyone I've ever met. And what he did differently than anyone else that I've met is he, he sat patiently before the Lord and waited. He was still before God and allowed God to to, to look at his anger and purify his anger and lead him out on a new path. And this guy 
is making more head, headway into this issue and, more, and, and creating more restoration and more beauty out of the ashes of our culture than anyone I've ever met. And it's because he pushed the pause button. Make sure that, the, that the, the things you're passionate about, the things that, are, are, that, you're, that you're after, that you're for, make sure that, that you don't just jump in, that you actually pause and you wait for the Lord. And as we pause, what it allows us to do is it brings us to the next step, which I think is so critical, is that we ponder. This word is hard for me. <laughs> it really is. Because what it means is to think about something carefully, especially before making a decision or reaching a conclusion. And I replace the word think with pray. To pray about something carefully, especially before making a decision or reaching a conclusion. This is what it looks like to ponder. To be still before the Lord, to wait patiently on him. To bring our our, our. our our need for justice to God, to bring our struggle, to bring our anger, to bring our frustration, to bring our pain before the Lord and to ponder it. And the very first thing we have to pray about, the very first thing we have to think about, think through at the feet of God is we have to ponder our desire. You and I, we have to ponder our desire. And what I mean by that is you have to be willing to ask yourself the question, what is it that I really want? Like, I know I feel angry, but what's, what's below the anger? What's behind the anger? What are the layers back behind this? What is, it that, that what is my true intention? What is it that I'm defending? What is it that I am protecting? And as we do this, uh, we begin to ask ourselves the question, well, do I long to invite people into a restorative process? Do I long for their redemption? Uh, you go back and I, I read that definition uh, that I read to you earlier about what righteous anger looks like. And, it, and, and I'm thinking, is my anger that right now? Do I even want my anger to be that right now? Sometimes if we're honest, the answer is no. We have to pause, we have to ponder, and we have to ponder our very intentions. Do I long to to create an increase in beauty in that person's life? Do I love them? And you're like, whoa, like love? There are people, some of the people that, that you have in your brain right now that make you angry or some of the situations, love is the farthest thing from you. And I want to pause here for just a second and address something that I believe that we've believed that's a lie in our culture. And what we have believed is that you can't love someone and be angry at them. We believe that that in order to love each other well, we have to approve 100% of any actions that those people around us take. That is not love. It's just not. True love always gets angry about the right things. Anger isn't the opposite of love. At all, it's a part of love. Because what we believe is that it's the opposite, but what the opposite of love is, is actually hate, or, or in some ways even worse, indifference. Those are the opposite of love. And, and what, one of the things I've been wrestling with throughout the last few months is, is this, this statement that I, that I hope really messes with your brain. So listen closely here, and if you hear nothing else today, this might be for you. Anger is love in motion towards a perceived threat to that which you love. Anger is love in motion towards a perceived threat to that which you love. And some of you are like, I don't understand. What do you mean? There's something you value, something that you love so much that when you see that it's threatened, maybe it's control. You love control. And so your love for control motivates you to protect your control with anger. Maybe you love peace in your home. Some of us don't even know what peace in our home looks like. You love it. And when it's threatened through chaos in your home, you get angry because you love it. And you're moving towards this perceived threat to that which you love. Maybe it's your image Maybe it is uh, the, your, your success at your job. Maybe it's your success in school. Uh, maybe you're angry at your partner that you're supposed to be doing that lab together with because you value, you love good grades. And so they're standing in your way uh, of an A because they're, you feel like they're lazy or they're incompetent. And you're angry and you're moving towards them because they're a perceived threat to something that you value, something that you love. Anger is love in motion towards a perceived threat to that which you love. I had a moment just yesterday. 
I was on my way to a Bible study. A Bible study, friends, okay? Some of the people that were in that Bible study are in this room. I'm driving there. I, I left a little early because of the snow, but I didn't quite leave as early as I wanted to. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost there and I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to our meeting spot and it's super snowy and it's uh, super gross in the streets and the light in front of me is red and there's a car coming that's, uh, was headed towards me that stopped at that stoplight. And they, they don't have a signal on there. I think they're going straight. I'm thinking to myself, this light's about to turn green. So I don't want to stop completely because the snow was really deep in that spot. And I thought I might get stuck. So I'm going to just slow down and time it. So I hit the green light and I can just keep going through. And so I do that and I approach the light. And just like I thought it would, the light turns green and this guy pulls out right in front of me. Right in front of me with like a hundred feet to spare. And I instantly was angry instantly angry and I was like on the horn, not just like a simple beep. You know, sometimes you're like, beep, like, sorry, hey, I'm here. No, this was not that. This was this one. Nah, you know where your, your arm is extended? And if you could push, this is what it looks like for the side, right? Where you're pushing, like if you could push it harder, you would make it louder, but it doesn't work that way. I was mad. Like, how dare he pull out in front? Like, I almost hit him. And I'm like, Brian, you're preaching on anger tomorrow. <laughs> Eat the word before you teach the word. Like, what are you going to tell your people tomorrow about anger? And you're, you're over here, like, punching a hole through your steering wheel, trying to make your horn louder? And then I ask myself the question, what am I really angry about? What does this anger say about the things that I love and value? If anger really is love and motion towards a perceived threat, what do I sense is threatened right now. It really wasn't my, my life or my car. Honestly, I had control. I went around him. It was not that big a deal. What was, at, what was at stake there? What was threatened there? It said I was a little bit late. I wanted to be on time. My image to the group mattered. I wanted to be the leader who gets there early enough to unlock the door and not the leader who pulls up and everyone's already parked there waiting for me to unlock the door. It mattered to me how people perceived me. And I loved that more than I loved the person who was driving on the road with me. So it unleashed anger. It was sin. Unrighteous. There was no holiness there. I didn't want what was best for him. I wanted him to have his license revoked. <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? And we laugh, but it's true. You have to be willing to ponder your desire and to ask the question, what is it that I love so much? And if you can figure that out, you're going you're gonna to actually discover something about yourself that maybe is a little, a little difficult, a little hard. Because the next thing you have to ponder is you have to ponder your pain and you have to ponder your sin. You have to ponder your pain and sin because if you ask the question, what's behind my anger? You're going to find one of probably two things or maybe a combination. You're either going to find pain because someone else's sinful anger or sinful decisions has wounded you and it's wounded you deeply. And, and we talk about how there's different levels of anger. There's a level one anger that is, is kind of like the everyday like frustrations that you experience and then sometimes it grows deeper and becomes level two, level three, level four, level five anger is the kind of anger that hopefully most of us have never experienced or never engaged in that becomes destructful, raging, uh, violent anger. But what happens is that as, as we uh, pull back the layers and we say, why am I really angry? What is it that I love? What is it that I value? What, what is it that I perceive as threatened in me or in my life? Sometimes we see pain there and we realize, man, I am constantly at like a level three. Not on the outside where people can see it, but deep inside of me, I am constantly at a level three. We're like the Incredible Hulk. Where he says, they say, what's your secret? And he says, I'm always angry. And that's you. The, so your anger is right there. It's so easy for you to get angry because there's something broken inside of you that someone else did or because of a, de a decision that you made yourself. It's either pain or it's sin or it's a combination of both. And we, we look at that. And, and we spend a lot of time at this church talking about how to deal with that pain. And I want you to know that that is a big deal. And I know there are people in here that carry woundedness and carry anger because of things that were inflicted on you and that God wants to heal that. God longs to heal that, but it takes vulnerability and a willingness to admit that you're angry. 
And there are other people in this room, though, that, that, that your, your anger is just straight up sinful. And what Augustine says about this is that, that when you have disproportionate anger, meaning that the anger doesn't seem to match the, the crime, that it's almost always an issue of disordered love. In his book, Confessions, he says this. He says it's almost always an issue of disordered love. Like the, the things you love are out of order. He would say that it's love God, love others, love self. And when that gets out of order, then our, our anger gets out of order. Our anger grows disproportionate because we've taken good things and made them ultimate things. We've taken good things and made them ultimate things. And so I don't know what that looks like for you. I know what it has looked like in times in, in my life where I've, I've elevated control or, or elevated the, the need to be right because I believe I'm right in a situation. I've elevated that over relationships, over people. And made a good thing, an ultimate thing. It's, good, it's a good thing to be right. It's a good thing to have to not be out of control and to have control over a situation, to have something run smoothly. But it's a bad thing if you allow that to, to trigger anger and if you make that into an ultimate thing that you will protect at any cost. You have to ask yourself the question, is my love disordered? Is it out of whack? Is it out of sync? Have I allowed a good thing to become an ultimate thing? We see this, um, just picture the, the, the teenage love relationship. When the boy breaks up with the girl and she's, her life is over, a good thing has become an ultimate thing in that moment. That's just a, a, a one example of the way this happens. A good thing becomes an ultimate thing. And disordered love always leads to unrighteous anger. So as we ponder our pain and ponder our sin, we have to ask the Lord the question, how, is my, how are my loves disordered? Because what happens is when, when, we, when we step into this kind of anger, disordered anger, we attack the person and not the problem. Disordered anger always attacks the person and not the problem. And what we end up doing is, we, uh, is when, we, when we step in and we engage with our anger, we use a carpet bomb instead of a surgical strike. And, and if you don't know what a carpet bomb is, basically it's this massive explosion that can, that can decimate entire city blocks. And sometimes when we have disordered love and disordered anger, we do that relationally. We do that in our communities. We use a carpet bomb and, and the collateral damage is always huge. We always end up creating more pain and creating more problems than solving them. So what do we do? We can't get stuck here, friends. Uh, and so this is the hard thing about going through this process of, of finding righteous and holy anger is that so often we do one but not all of the steps. We identify a righteous cause and we stop there and it becomes unrighteous anger. Uh, we, we, we pause and we wait and we ponder, what am, what am I really thinking? Uh, what am I really doing? What are my true intentions? How are my loves out of order? And then if we stop there, we grow uh, despondent about our own brokenness. We move into the self-flagellation mode where we're like beating ourselves up because we're obviously terrible human beings. I've been there. I've done that. We can't stop there because what we have to do is move past the pondering of our pain and our sin and our brokenness to pondering God. We have to move to the next step where we look to God to find healing because he longs to give it to us. Psalm 147.3 says this. It says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted. He wants to heal your broken heart. He wants to bind up your wounds. He wants to address that pain that causes level two or three anger to always be there underneath the surface for you. He longs to bind up your wounds. And he longs to bind up the wounds that you inflicted on others. This is our God. And we can't stop at our pain and our sin. We have to move past this to look at him and to see what it is that God has for us. And this is a process. Day after day, sitting patiently, waiting before the Lord and looking at him and allowing him to begin to peel back the layers of our hurt and our brokenness and to restore us. And not only do we need to look to God to find healing, we have to look to God to find forgiveness we have to look to God to see what righteous anger looks like. Listen to this other quote from Dan Allender. 
He says, righteous anger invites change. This is what God does for us. His anger towards our brokenness and our sin invites us to change. It's wounding, but it's restorative. It invites change because it can envision what the other might look like if the arrogance controlling their heart was pierced. Anger is a surgical weapon designed to destroy ugliness and restore beauty. And in the hands of one who is trained in love and who can envision beauty, the knife of righteous anger is a weapon for restoration. What would it look like, church, if we began to live out this kind of anger? And what it would look like if, if we were ones who were trained in love what would it look like if we engaged God who, who engages this kind of, of, of anger? We would no longer uh, be living out disordered love and disordered uh, anger. We would no longer be throwing out carpet bombs everywhere we go, creating this, this path of destruction relationally. We wouldn't be that. We would step into ordered love and therefore ordered and righteous anger. And God would, would prepare us and teach us how to make surgical strikes against the problem and not against the person. Because that's what a surgical strike of anger does. It strikes against the problem and not the person. And this is what Jesus did for me. This is what Jesus does for all of us. Never before in the history of the world has a more incredible, brilliant, surgical strike of love ever occurred than Jesus. Unbelievable what he did. That in the hands of one who is trained in love and who can envision beauty, the knife of righteous anger is a weapon for restoration and Jesus brings restoration to you and I today. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. And this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still broken, while we were still struggling with our motives and our disordered love, while we were still in that place, Christ said, I will make a surgical strike against all of the brokenness of humanity. And the verse right after that in Romans 5, 9 talks about uh, what, what happened with the wrath of God towards the brokenness of humanity and how Jesus took it all on himself. It's unbelievable if we are ever to get our love reordered, if we're ever to experience righteous anger, we must first experience the surgical strike of love that is Jesus. We must be melted by his love in order to be transformed into people who can do it God's way. Anger is a gift from God, but it is a powerful and dangerous weapon when we don't give it back to God. Friends, it's not that we need to stop being angry. It's that we're not deeply angry enough. Our anger is surface. It is shallow. It's not as authentic as it could be. Bring it to God. He will deepen it. He will purify it. And he will teach you how to use it as a surgical strike for the redemption of people around you. I'm convinced of it. But it has to start with you personally having an experience of Jesus' love and his grace and his mercy. Are you ready? Are you ready today? Are you ready to admit that you're angry? Are you willing to press the pause button in your life? Are you willing to ponder? Are you really willing to actually ponder your motives and your desires and and ask, what does my anger say about what I love? Are you willing to look at your pain and look at your sin? And then are you willing to look at God and see his face and see the one who showed up here, who drew near to us in the midst of our brokenness, and said, I will take it all for you. Allow me to transform you. Allow me to heal you. That's the invitation today. And I want to pray for you. Let's pray. Jesus, I don't know what I would do. I can't imagine life without you. The brokenness and the destruction, the failed attempts at anger, Jesus, there are so many people in this room that carry so many things. They carry pain, they carry sin, they carry broken ideas about what anger even is, Lord. And so right now in this place, we choose to push the pause button. 
And if you're sitting here today and, and God is convicting you in your heart that you've been doing anger the wrong way, I just invite you right now in the quiet of your own heart to simply come to Jesus and say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me, Lord. Please forgive me for the way that I've created damage instead of creating restoration. Please forgive me for the way that I've wounded my wife or my husband or my children or my parents or my coworkers or my classmates or my friends. God, forgive me for the ways that I have used anger as a carpet bomb and created collateral damage. God, forgive me for the times when I should have been angry, but I wasn't and I just walked away. Forgive me for the times that that I didn't engage when you were calling me to engage, God. I confess that I have failed in this area and I ask for your forgiveness, but I also, God, ask that you would begin the process of filling me up with your goodness and your love and your truth. God, we give you permission right now to do a surgical strike in our own heart to reveal to us the places that are still filled with pain, still filled with woundedness, still filled with sin. And God, we ask that you would begin to cut those things out so that we could become whole. So right now, Jesus, for those who are here today and desperately need you, who need to experience your love for the first time or maybe to experience your love in a renewed way, I ask God that you would just meet them here and gently and beautifully draw them into a relationship with you so that they could be transformed. Change our anger from unrighteous, disordered, to beautiful, holy, righteous, ordered, God-centered, reparative, amazing anger. We give it to you, God. Change it. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.